This episode brought to you by ExpressVPN, the best VPN there is. Take back your online privacy today. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. Guy, remember it so you don't have to. Well, after two of the biggest movies to ever hit Hollywood, we saw the return of James Cameron, Eddie Furlong, Linda Hamilton, and Arnold Schwarzenegger in the third cinematic installment of the Terminator franchise, Terminator 3. D at Universal Studios Florida. Oh, and some dumbasses made this. before I'm too hard on this movie. I can't say this is the worst of the Terminator films. Honestly, it has quite a few things I like in it. But it's the first one that made you conscious of, oh yeah, this is just another franchise. It'd be like making a subpar sequel to Spirited Away or Shawshank Redemption. It sucks out that unique special feeling and reminds you this can be watered down like anything else. With that said, the film does have some interesting things about it. One is, it came out the same year Arnold was elected governor in 2003, which means he's the first politician to be elected and have the number one movie. Two, it's the first Terminator film to be released by Warner Brothers. Actually, the rights have been passed to more studios than... Huh, I guess anything now. And three, it's the first Terminator film not to be written and directed by James Cameron. And boy, does it show! If Terminator 2 was the Dark Knight of the Batman movies, this is certainly the Batman Forever of the franchise. Not the worst, but certainly lighter and nowhere near as epic. With that said though, is there anything worth remembering fondly in this movie? Or is it only the start of Judgment Day for this franchise? Well, let's talk to the hand to find out. This is Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines. So remember the epic credits to the other two films going from simple but memorable to iconic and haunting? Well, now it's just credits. Black background, play them while the movie acts out. They're about as memorable as... Oh, that's weird, I don't remember. Even the apocalyptic future is kind of lame now. I remember skulls and fire, a blue laser-filled wasteland of death. Now it looks like an app you use to blow up pictures on your phone. Hey, remember when I took that city picture from the plane? Oh my god, it blew up, it blew up! Now I'm gonna use it to blow up my ex-girlfriend! Oh my gosh, she blew up, she really blew up! It's real. As you quickly figure out, this film doesn't look bad, but nothing about it is iconic. We see John Connor, played this time by Nick Stahl, hopping from place to place trying to keep a low profile after he stopped Judgment Day. My name is John Connor. They tried to murder me before I was born. Stahl's a good actor and I'm sure could play an emotionally exhausted hero, but like a lot of actors in this, he doesn't sound beaten down by all the chaos he's witnessed. He sounds bored from saying the same lines the other Terminator films have repeated over and over. The future has not been written. My mother told me the storm was coming. Three billion lives would vanish in an instant. There is no fate but what we make for ourselves. How many different ways do you want me to tell the same story? It's like saying with great power comes I don't even have to complete that because you're so tired of hearing it. After the millionth time, it just doesn't leave that much of an impact unless you add something new. With that said, something new is added. Another Terminator sent back called the TX, played by Kristana Loken. The first one was Schwarzenegger, a giant beast of a man who barely talked. The second was Patrick, a much smaller model but had more social skills. Like the machines learned how to be more human in between movies. So now that it's a woman, often seen as more social than men, this could be really creepy. But unlike Patrick, who balanced emotionally understanding and emotionally bankrupt sometimes in the same shot, this one just likes things. I like this car. I like your gun. I like turtles. I've seen this actress on TV and she's fine at what she does, but like Stahl, I don't think they knew how to utilize her. She's neither expressive nor robotic enough to be threatening. Where did he go? Tell me, where did he go? I think the focus was more on her being sexy. And don't get me wrong, Schwarzenegger and Patrick were exploited for that too. But the number one priority was still to make them scary. And something tells me that wasn't their prime focus with this one. Go Zongus. Oh my god. Are you okay? Oh. What are you- Oh, did I mention this movie is rated a very soft, boring R? 
where most movies have to fight to bring the rating down. This one, I think, had to fight to bring it up. There's practically no swearing, most of the deaths are off screen, any blood shown is usually fake blood from a machine. With the exception of one creative kill, this could easily pass for PG-13. Maybe even PG! Now, of course, gore doesn't make a huge difference in these movies. I mean, it makes a pretty big difference. It makes a huge difference, and here's why. In Terminator 2, we don't see Patrick kill this cop, because they're saving it for the second time he kills someone, and it's a huge payoff. Here, the first kill is off screen. Okay, that's fine, building it up, but here's the second kill. Let me see your license and registration. I like your gun. What? It's also off screen. In fact, the majority of deaths are just gunshots, stuff we've seen a million times. And you guessed it, they're mostly done off screen. The gore wasn't just gore in the last one. It added a believable threat, taking a relatively silly idea and making it feel credible. Here, it's just random. So the TX, who could have been the scariest machine of them all, turns out to be the blandest. But thankfully, the one thing this Terminator does pretty well is the Terminator. Talk to For the, the most part, there's a lot to unpack. Arnold returns looking pretty good considering he was mid-50s here. And he once again has to go looking for clothes and locates a Chippendale bar. Yeah, just cross off tails and I think that's pretty accurate. They go for your clothes. Patience, honey. Okay, so you might have put together this Terminator film 12 years after the iconic last one has a lot of self-satire. We didn't want that, but here it is. And the only thing more annoying than that is, it's actually not that bad at it. Hear me out! The reason I think it works okay in this is because it's still written around what the Terminator would actually do. We all know this cringy ass scene. Talk to the hand. But when you see where he got it from, it's surprisingly pretty clever. You close. Talk to the hand. Now. That's silly, but I buy it. He's still hurting the guy, but he's complying too because he does want the clothes. Even those dumbass glasses. He tries them on, scarring fans for life, but he then crushes them. This is a machine that smiles when holding a gigantic gun. I totally believe he would do this. Should he be in these situations? No, but when he is, he reacts the proper way. And that believability is funny to me. Talk to the Most hand. of the time, move on please. We see an injured Connor breaks into a vet's office to patch himself up when one of the vets named Kate, played by Claire Danes, spots him while tending to an early morning cat owner. How much did you take? Enough. This is the stuff we use to chemically neuter dogs. Eh, no wonder I looked at my balls after they fell off. I'm gonna be traumatized when I sober up. <laughs> Leader of the resistance, everybody! The resistance of going walkies? My Kripke's basement. What? You're John Connor. I recognize how much you don't look like your younger self. We went to West Hills Junior High together. How could you forget me? I was your redheaded best friend! It looks like Kate made out with John when they were kids, literally the day before the Terminator entered his life. So, is this supposed to be her? Is that why she knew he'd be at the Galleria? No, no, I much more buy that these two made out. The TX arrives shooting the cat owner, and I give credit. They really made me think this movie was going to be this crazy. Catherine Brewster? No. If they gave that feature to the other Terminators, the ads would have written themselves. Not that her reaction when she does find blood from a target is much better. Again, just imagine one of the other Terminators doing that when they find a target. Sarah Connor? Yes. Speaking of which, Arnold's the party pooper and stops the TX before she can kill our heroes. You here to kill me? I am programmed to take four dramatic steps before answering your question. No. That's the good news. The bad news is I'm really bad at the protecting you part. Connor and Kate escape, but we discover the TX can control other machines. One of the few additions that's actually a good idea, and like most things in this movie, is kinda taken advantage of. Wow, wait till I tell the fangirls he does smoke down there. Wanna see the best cop ever? 
Hi, dangerous looking armed man approaching me. You see anything strange around here? I just think too many happy thoughts. Eddie, we got us a ride. Open the door. He crashes into a pissed Mark Cuban, allowing the police and TX to catch up, leading to, let's be honest, a pretty fun chase scene. It's not quite Terminator 2 good, but it is inventive, and most of the destruction was shot on set. In fact, the film ran out of money before they could shoot this crane building crash, but Arnold liked it so much, he paid for the scene out of pocket. So while we see a cool stunt, Arnold is seeing... But on the plus side, you get to keep the residuals for this. You folks already know all about ExpressVPN, how could you not? I talk about them all the time on this show. I can't stress enough the importance of protecting your online activity from big tech who track, spy, and profit off you. But there's actually another reason many of my viewers love using ExpressVPN. Netflix. Netflix. See, thousands of shows on Netflix are available outside of the U.S. Netflix. So you need to change your country if you want to access them. Netflix. What the ExpressVPN app does is it encrypts your data. Data, data. And reroutes it through a server location of your choice. This not only protects your data, data, but also lets you control which country you want Netflix to think you're in. I swallowed a bug. ExpressVPN lets you choose from over 90 different countries, so every time you run out of stuff to watch, you can just fire up the app on your laptop or smart TV, switch your country, and hit connect. Once you refresh the page, you'll get a brand new section of shows. It's that simple. It hits you like a diamond, right here, in the diamond part of your body. You can use ExpressVPN to unlock shows or sports on other streaming services too. I like using it to watch BBC iPlayer. It's free and only available in the UK. Look, there's a reason why ExpressVPN is the number one rated VPN provider by publishers like Wired, CNET, and most importantly, me. Because good. So be smart, protect your data data, and stop paying full price for streaming services while only getting access to a fraction of their content. Visit expressvpn.com slash nostalgiacritic right now and get three extra months of their service for free. That's expressvpn.com slash nostalgiacritic. Go to expressvpn.com slash nostalgiacritic to learn more. The more. A long way to go for that joke, I know, I don't care. I got my own problems, I swallowed a bug. Don't forget to check me out playing Kingdom Hearts Fridays from 6 to 9 on Twitch. Also, we've just added Tamara's Never Seen on Twitch as well, Saturdays at 5. We got content six days a week, hope to see you there. the TX, John is told why the same old obsolete Austrian model is back for the third time. We stopped Judgment Day. You only postponed it. Judgment Day is inevitable. Bucky eye mode engaged. You've got to be shitting me. No, I am not shitting you. I guess I shouldn't be shocked this is the plot for a sequel to the last one, but couldn't they work in the inevitable Judgment Day thing a little better? I mean, can you change the past or not? It'd be cool if we found out the date of Judgment Day was a lie from the machines. Like, you know, history's written by the winners, so they changed the date to trick the future generations of humanity. That way they could explain why the date would be different, but also keep true to the idea that you can't alter the past to change the future. Which the first one, and arguably the second one, were keeping to. I don't know, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, these people had years to think this story up. But in this, it doesn't feel clever, it feels forced. And oh boy, did I time feels forced with the perfect moment. I'm utilizing the same diet the writers had when they wrote this script high as fuck. Are you gonna pay for that? Talk to the hand. That's our Austin Revista scene, everybody! We got your money, it's too late. Enjoy, Internet! 
scene truly is tragic as it blocks out what's honestly a pretty humorous scene right after. Just finish reading my lines for this stinker. Get me out of this! Fuck! How do you make up for these two having no chemistry? Talk about off-camera time when they did have chemistry. We made out in Kripke's basement. You and me hooked up the day before I first met him. And now, again, ten years later. It all sounds like some bad movie. Their next stop, the Terminator takes them to Sarah Connor's tomb. is what happens when Linda Hamilton decomposes. Her friends scattered her ashes in the sea, distort these weapons in accordance with her will. Huh, feel like she could have just hit him with the other weapons. In fact, what if a killer robot from the future didn't come back in time to tell John all that? How the hell would he know to find them there? I literally think the only reason this was written into the film was to give us this scene where the police arrive and Arnold carries a coffin shooting a gun. Which I'm not gonna lie, I saw in the trailer and I did say, I wonder how they're gonna get to this point. I'm carrying the corpse of this movie away, just like I'm carrying the last of this film. Hey look, the psychiatrist from the other two films. Bye! TX takes on the identity of Kate's fiancé to trick her, revealing yards away that she's an imposter. A Tasmanian devil is more stealth than you! When the Terminator reveals why Kate is so important to the Resistance. And it's done in a way that's time so silly, you'll want to hear this music over it. Later, your children will become important. What? She's your wife. They stop the TX in time, but not before she does some damage to their ride. We need a new vehicle. Maybe a Predator sequel or the Expendables. I don't think I can get much more out of this one. Kate is heartbroken that her fiancé, whom which they've shared a total of 40 seconds of screen time together, is gone. We gotta keep moving. No, no, not he's not even worth IND being his name. But sometimes things happen we just can't change. Their whole romance can be summed up in two words. Sucks. Yeah. When they discover Kate's military father might be targeted. Yeah, in the early 2000s, all female love interests had powerful fathers. Kate and John say they want to go save him despite the Terminator refusing. Go to her father, we get him to shut Skynet down! I calculate a 83% probability that he will not pull that trigger. This is when Kate grabs the gun, aims it at John, and the Terminator agrees. Hey, it's no talk to the hand, but I think it would have been funny. He eventually agrees, and they head towards her father's base. But Kate questions the motivations of this killing machine. If we get killed, does that mean anything to you? If you were to die, I will become useless. There will be no reason for me to exist. Thanks, Dad. Why didn't he send you back? He was dead. What? What are you saying? I killed you. Ugh, spoilers. One of the other great things about Arnold's character is that it is a different model. It's updated with more human psychology. It can lie, it has an understanding of emotions, but it's still a machine who doesn't have any interest in them. It would have been so easy to make him more emotional because of this, but that was the last model. He didn't understand emotions, so he was trying to learn. This one does, and still keeps John at a distance, which honestly makes him one of the more interesting Terminators in these films. He understands psychology, yet shows no emotion. I really do give kudos that they didn't go too sappy with this, as it would have been so easy to do so. With that said, it does come across a little more like a sitcom sometimes. Your levity is good. It relieves tension and the fear of death. Life is unfair. It looks like Skynet has shut down all of America's military defense while TX sneaks in to no doubt program the machines to destroy Uvi Ball before Blood Rain. Sir? Shall I? No. It's my job now. There's a surprisingly powerful moment when Skynet is about to be turned on to relaunch the weapon systems, and everyone knows the danger involved. So much so that Kate's father takes personal responsibility in pushing the button to launch it. Scenes like this do stop the film from being totally forgettable and actually add a little weight to what they're talking about. With that said, oops. Watch out! She'll be back. Whoa, that makes me look at that line differently. Oh wait, no, it's just a dumb joke. Wow, that was a surprisingly weak-ass missile. What, was it supposed to make your ears pop? TX catches up to him, though, and they split up. What? 
You remind me of my mother. Dude, get laid. Let's mix things up. We haven't seen Arnold in a bathroom fight yet. Well, this actress just got an achievement unlocked she never thought she'd reach. Don't make me talk to your heart. Again, give this scene a shout out. Some of the moves these two perform are goofily fun. And despite not showing any emotion, you can tell they probably had a good time performing them. Smokin? She knocks him out and reprograms him so that he can chase after Connor as well. He made it! Get away from me! Yes, that means walk closer. You really are the worst predicted messiah! And I've known some really shitty ones! Let him go! Jesus, give that stunt woman an Oscar! Give any stunt performer an Oscar, damn it! What is your mission? To ensure the survival of John Connor. Is this the human emotion you call over underacting? He turns the car into a Street Fighter bonus level and turns off his system. Honestly, in a pretty embarrassing pose. What happened? Couldn't do it. He shut himself down. I also think he took his dick out and placed it on that SUV. He didn't even get that car's name. John and Kay fly to the location where the Terminator said they can stop Skynet, but the way is blocked. It's a code prompt. Oh, what's the elvish word for friend? But it looks like the TX got to the chopper, and not surprisingly, so did Arnold. How come nobody ever knows about his Deus Ex Machi backup? I smell a gimmick. I'm back. You know, not every line needs to be the I need a vacation line. He stops the TX who has resorted to roars and growls. <laughs> Did she do that before? Were those like her original lines in the movie? Lady, have you any idea how fast you were going? <laughs> what? And blows her up while giving the only line I don't think he was trying on. You are terminated. I think I earned the right to phone one in. I am the only thing you're gonna remember from this movie. They discover, though, that they weren't being led to Skynet's destruction. They were being led to a shelter while Judgment Day still takes place. Why did he lead us down here? To live. There was never any stopping it. So, I'm kind of split on this. On the one hand, I'm impressed this movie would be ballsy enough to do this. Most of the film is very light, so to end with a super downer send-off, practically making the last film irrelevant, I'll admit, does take guts to do. I also like that a lot of the film is John running away from his responsibilities as a leader, and he ultimately discovers there is no running from it, so he has to embrace it. But... Hey, this is the same movie that has this. Talk to the hand. One of these things is not like the other. And B, remember how he said this? We stopped Judgment Day. You only postponed it. Yet he talks about how Judgment Day is inevitable and you can't change it. Except you did. You changed Judgment Day. The other film you went back in time to change things and you changed things. So why couldn't you try to stop it from happening again? Even if time does find a way to correct itself, it still shows stuff can be altered, so why not alter as much as possible? I'm probably reading too deep into it. I just hate when a film acts like, of course this is how time travel works, idiot, when you can go, no, you're the idiot, idiot. This is all bullshit, at least it can be consistent bullshit, idiot. Relax. But whatever, that was Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines. It's nowhere near the worst, but it's nowhere near the best. It's just another action movie, but with that said, it's an action movie with a decent idea here and there, some enjoyable stunts, and along with every groaner, there are some decent laughs as well. Most of them from Arnold. He really is what carries this movie, but he shouldn't be the best part of a Terminator film. The writing, directing, supporting cast, mind-blowing effects, and epic sigh should be the best parts about it. But I don't know, it is short, it doesn't overstay its welcome, and it has a few fun moments. But it was clear that Judgment Day had come, and the future of the franchise was not looking very hopeful. I'm a nostalgia critic, and it only gets better from here. Your levity is good, it relieves tension and the fear of death. 
Hey, Doug Walker here doing the charity shout out and this week we are doing the GBS CIDP Foundation International. Man, that's a mouthful. <laughs> uh, this organization, it's just easier if I say this organization, uh, works to improve the quality of life for individuals and families worldwide affected by GBS, CIDP, and variants. Uh, if you're wondering what that is, I uh, looked into it. Uh, GBS is an inflammatory disorder of nerves outside the brain and spinal cord. It is characterized by the rapid onset of numbness, weakness, and often paralysis of the legs, arms, breathing muscles, and face. So it's not good news, definitely. Uh, this organization helps by providing a network for all patients, their, caregiver, their caregivers, and families, uh, providing public and professional educational programs worldwide designed to heighten awareness and improve the understanding and treatment of GBS. And it also has a four-star rating on Charity Navigator. Uh, as you can hear, this is just such a difficult thing for anyone to go through. So please check them out, uh, donate if you can, uh, and if not, if you're tight on money, just spread the word. Uh, as I always say, just spreading the word of uh, the good that people are doing in this world is always, it, it does a lot of good as well. So just the more you can share the good, the better you'll feel too, man. So uh, yeah, see what you can do, check them out, and I'll see you next time. Take care.